Today on Real Chemistry, we're going to talk about naming molecular compounds. The idea here is to be able to go from a chemical formula for a molecular compound, like S2O3, to its name, disulfur trioxide. Or to go the other direction, say you're given the name carbon dioxide, you should be able to write down, after watching this video, that that corresponds to CO2. The first thing we're going to do in this video is talk about how you can identify a molecular compound and compare it to an ionic compound. And the second thing we're going to do is talk about the naming rules for molecular compounds. So first, how do you identify a molecular compound? Well, it turns out that a molecular compound is a mixture of two nonmetals. So if you look at the periodic table below, everything in blue is a metal and everything in yellow is a nonmetal. And when you mix a metal and a nonmetal, you get an ionic compound. When you mix two nonmetals, you get a molecular compound. The main difference between these two different types of compounds is the chemical bonds that hold the elements together. In molecular compounds, covalent bonds hold them together. And that's a sharing of electrons. So the electrons are shared between the two elements that are held together. On the other hand, in ionic compounds, an ionic bond holds them together. And that's just a difference in charge between the two elements that is due to a transferred electron. So the basic take home point here is if you see two nonmetals in a compound, that's a molecular compound. And that's when you're gonna apply the rules I'm about to tell you about. On the other hand, if you see a metal plus a nonmetal, then you need to use a different set of rules. The set of rules that I talked about in my video on naming ionic compounds. So what are the rules for naming molecular compounds? Well, what we're gonna do here is we're gonna use a set of prefixes to indicate how many elements of each type we have in our molecule. So over here, you see that we have, say, the prefix mono, and that just means one, or the prefix tri, and that means three. And so we use these prefixes and molecular compounds to tell us how many of each element type we have. And the basic formula for naming these is first we start out with the first prefix. By that I mean the prefix you need for the first element listed. So in this case, you see that nitrogen is the first element listed. And since nitrogen is the first element listed, then the prefix for nitrogen, in this case, would be di. So that's what it means to write down the first prefix. Now, then it says write the first element name. Well, since the first element is nitrogen, we'd write nitrogen. Then it says the second prefix. That just means the prefix for our second element listed. In this case, we have oxygen with an implied one there. So that would be mono. And then we write the base name of our second element. So in this case, since we have oxygen, the base name is just the first syllable. So that would be ox. And then we'd add ide at the end. So let's go ahead and apply these rules to name N2O. So I'm going to erase all these strokes. And the first thing we want to do is we want to write down the prefix for two, because our first element listed is nitrogen, and the number of nitrogens there is two. And we look over at our table, and we see that the prefix di means two. So that means our name is going to start with di. And then the next thing we do, after we write our first prefix, we write the first element name. And in this case, we have nitrogen, so we just put nitrogen there. And that makes one word, di-nitrogen. Okay, the next thing we do is we write the second prefix. So the second prefix tells us how many of the second element we have. And in this case, there's just one of our oxygens. Whenever there's no number written there, there's just an implied one. And so then if we go over to our table, that tells us we need to use mono before writing out the base name of oxygen. So we're going to write mono since there's one oxygen. Then we're going to write the base name of the element since that O stands for oxygen, which you can get from the periodic table if you ever get confused. The base name of that's the first syllable, or ox. So mono, ox, and then finally, the last thing we do is we add ide. So what we get is dinitrogen monooxide. That's the name of N2O. So that's how we can go from a chemical formula to the name. Let's do a few more examples of those before we try going the other direction. So let's say that we have NF3. Well, there what we're going to do is we're going to write the prefix for our first element. And our first element is nitrogen. And we can see that there's an implied one there. Here's just a little bit of a wrinkle in these rules. If the first prefix is mono, then we just drop it. So if there's one of our first element, we don't need to use a prefix. Technically speaking, if you put mono there, it's not wrong. But you just drop it, so instead of writing mono, we just write nothing, and we go straight to our second step. So that is only the case if 
our first prefix is gonna be mono. So you see right here, it says drop the first prefix if it's mono. So since we only have one of those nitrogens, we're not gonna write a prefix with it, and we're just gonna start with the first element name, which is nitrogen. So I'm just gonna start by writing nitrogen. Okay, now the next thing I need to do is write the second prefix. And I can see that my second element is fluorine and that there's three of them. If I go over to my table, it tells me, oh, whenever I have three of something, use try. So that means I'm gonna write try here. And then we can see that my element is fluorine. And so when I write the base name of that, it's just floor. And then finally, the last thing I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add that ide. So NF3 is nitrogen trifluoride. So hopefully you're starting to get the hang of this. We'll do one more example of going from a chemical formula to its name. Here we have N2H4. So the first prefix we're gonna write, wanna write, it corresponds to this two. So we're gonna write dye. That's the prefix that corresponds to two. And then you can see that our element is nitrogen. So we're just gonna write out nitrogen. And that makes up the first part of the name. And then we have four hydrogens. And so that means we're gonna to wanna to use tetra because that's the prefix that corresponds to four. So dinitrogen tetra. And then we have hydrogen and the base name of hydrogen is just hydrogen. So we write hydrogen with that R. And then we add ide. So it becomes dinitrogen tetrahydride. So that's how we name molecular compounds. That is compounds that are mixtures of two nonmetals. What about going the other direction? That's pretty straightforward. So in this case, we're just gonna be given a name and we wanna go back to the chemical formula. Well, I've broken this process down into steps. You may not even need the steps. What I like to do is first just identify the elements of my compound. And so here we can see that we have sulfur there, which tells me I have sulfur, and fluoride there, which tells me I have fluorine. And so I just write, like to write the chemical symbol for sulfur and fluorine. And then what I do, my step two, is I go back and write the subscripts. So step one is just write the elemental symbols. Step two is write those subscripts. So I can see that the first sub SI prefix I have, or I'm sorry, the first prefix I have is di, which tells me that I have two sulfurs. The next prefix I have is deca on fluoride, and that means I should put 10 next to the fluorine because down here on our prefix list, we can see that deca corresponds to 10. So the biggest challenge here really is memorizing that list of prefixes so that you can name all these molecular compounds. All right, let's do another example where we're gonna go from the name to the chemical formula. Here we have phosphorus trihydride. And again, I'm gonna start off by writing the chemical symbols for the two elements I have. And so if I see phosphorus there, which has the chemical symbol P. Again, I can get that from the periodic table if I need to. And then I have hydride, which is just hydrogen. So I have a P and an H. And what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna realize that, hey, there's actually no prefix here before phosphorus. And so what that means is since there's no prefix before phosphorus, I just have one of them. And then there's a tri for my prefix before hydrogen, which means that I have three hydrogens on here. So I have pH three. So that is what phosphorus trihydride is in terms of a chemical formula. So those, uh, the, the last example we'll do is sulfur hexafluoride. So here, once again, we can see that there's no prefix for sulfur. We know that we have the element sulfur. So I'm gonna write down S and then we know we have fluoride for our second element, so I'm gonna write down F. Since I have no prefix for sulfur, I just know there's one sulfur. And since I have the prefix hexa for my fluoride, when I go over to my prefix list, hexa score corresponds to six, so that means I should put a six down here by the fluorine. So sulfur hexafluoride is SF6. So this is basically how we name molecular compounds. We just use these prefixes to tell us how many of each element type we have and the element names. In the case of the second element, we use the base name plus I. Thanks for watching Real Chemistry. Please leave any questions below or visit my channel to see more chemistry videos or subscribe to receive updates in the future when I post videos.